Boy, Israel is trying to do so every day. The American people are absolutely turning uh, steadfastly, by the way, this is Jews in America, non-Jews in America against Israel because Israel is being genocidal right now. And we have, uh, again, a president who mumbles, a secretary of state who wrings his hands. He, he brings himself to tears, let me say, when he talks about what Israel is doing. Oh, please don't do that. And Netanyahu uh, reminds them, I run your government. You don't run your government. Uh, the Israel lobby runs it. So it's extraordinarily dangerous, the mindlessness of it, the cruelty of what Israel is doing, uh, the uh, a absolute recklessness of what Israel is doing. It could drag the U.S. into a wider war. It's trying. The U.S. leaders do not want a wider war. They actually don't. Uh, but they prove themselves not to be in charge day by day. They wring their hands. You know, I don't think, by the way, it's a, it's complete uh, theater when Biden says uh, – and when Blinken says, we don't want Israel to do that, it's it's not just faking it. It's more pathetic. What they're saying is, we're only the president and the secretary of state. They're Israel. They, they've got the lobby. They've got the campaign contributions. It's grotesque. So what happens every day, you can't be sure. I don't think it is the desire of the United States, given the state of the, the world, the state of its stockpiles, the state of the military, the state of public opinion, to want a wider war. But it's not impossible. Israel really uh, needs to be stopped from what it's doing. And there is a way to do it, incidentally. The way to do it is exactly the United States says, we're not arming you tomorrow. Israel cannot go one day to the next. I mean it. It's Yes, of course, it's, uh, it's got a little bit of stockpile, but it cannot go one day to the next without the active military support of the United States. The U.S. can stop this at any hour. And again, I'd like to remind them in the White House, that's the job of the U.S. president is actually to stop wars. My theory of America is the war machine is always revving, uh, certainly among uh, our uh, vassal states or the ones that rule the United States, however you see it. And the job of the president of the United States is to be a grown up and to keep the foot on the brake. So they could stop this war at any moment because Israel cannot prosecute this war this genocide, in my opinion, we'll see what the International Court of Justice says soon, but it cannot do this even day to day without the U.S. active logistics, munitions, intelligence, military support. One more question from Rick F. Is the recent one hour phone call between Shoigu and the French defense minister an encouraging sign or just damage control from French saber rattling? Your thoughts. I think in the uh, in in the gist uh, of what we've been discussing, it's better to have it than not to have it. Uh, I'm glad that it's taking place, and I and I think it's it's worth uh, basically uh, just a, a couple of minutes about the whole diplomacy issue. I do believe that at the beginning, Macron and Schultz uh, tried diplomacy and wanted to head off uh, the escalation that took place in February 2022. Again, the war started in February 2014. This is important to understand. The war did not start with the special military operation in February 2022. The war started with the violent overthrow of Yanukovych in which the United States played a major role. But the war was 10 years on and Macron and Schultz, I believe, tried to head it off. And I think President Putin's reaction at the beginning was, well, fine, but where's the American counterpart that uh, leads your military alliance? I don't hear from the U.S. because the U.S. had directly rejected diplomacy over a draft security agreement that President Putin put on the table in writing 
online, you can find it, uh, December 15, 2021. So the U.S. said, no, we're not going to negotiate over that. Mm -hmm. Schultz and Macron, in my understanding, uh, said to uh, Putin, well, NATO's not going to enlarge. And Putin said, why should I believe you? I need to hear from the United States. And the U.S. wasn't saying that because the U.S. didn't believe that at the time. Mm -hmm. The U.S. absolutely, totally believed NATO is enlarging. It may even believe it today because they're mm -hmm. fools. But in any event... So at the beginning, I think Schultz and Macron uh, tried. I think they went to the wrong capital, frankly, mm -hmm. because my advice back then was that Macron, Schultz, and Draghi, uh, so Italy, Germany, and France, go to Washington and say, under no way, shape, or form is NATO enlarging to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Are you crazy, Mr. President? Uh, is your intelligence service crazy? Are your neocons crazy? Is Victoria Nuland crazy? What is it? It should not, must not happen because otherwise we risk complete disaster in Europe. That's what they should have done. So rather than going to Moscow and saying that, which was fine, except President Putin's answer reportedly <laughs> was uh, to Schultz, uh, when Schultz said, uh, NATO will not enlarge as long as I'm chancellor, he looked at him and said, well, how long are you going to be chancellor? <laughs> you know, it, it, he, he absolutely batted it back. But what he meant was, look, this is a U.S. military alliance. And so we need, with the United States, some grown-up talk. Mm -hmm. And that never happened. And so I think the huge mistake of Europe, the huge mistake was the inability to stand up to the United States. This is the pathetic side. Well, of course, the U.S. has its influence, its power. The CIA has its influence. The U.S., uh, uh, the money side, the carrots and the sticks in, in uh, European capitals. But the truth of the matter is that Germany, France, and Italy, if they stood together, could say to the United States, stop wrecking Europe. They could. They don't. But they could. And that yeah. is what failed. So at this point, Macron's gone over to the other side rhetorically. It's it's weird because he's told me exactly the opposite in private. He told uh, he told uh, President Putin uh, the opposite. He knows, I believe, that this whole NATO enlargement business, which is alive till today, because we also hear it from the absolutely foolish, idiotic words of Jens Stoltenberg all the time, a man who does not have one moment of sense in him, but tells the truth, actually. <laughs> you know, he tells the truth about what he and NATO believe, which is quite interesting because he says, yes, of course, this is a war over NATO. But I believe that Macron knows all of this. But for whatever political reason, maybe the European elections, uh, maybe his misperceived politics, maybe whatever slight he feels, who knows? Uh, he, he's doing something different right now. But to answer the question, good that there was a, a call because every call at least establishes the possibility of some diplomacy. But the real diplomacy should be Europe extricating itself from the absolute recklessness of 30 years of uh, hegemonic aspirations, unipolarity. And Europe knew all of this. European leaders have told me all of this, how reckless the U.S. is. European leaders opposed the uh, 2008 invitation to Ukraine and to Georgia, for God's sake, uh, that's a North Atlantic country, uh, to join NATO. Uh, and uh, they've known all of this all along, but they don't have the capacity or they haven't had the capacity, I should mm -hmm. say. Merkel did uh, a bit, a bit, uh, but uh, not Schultz uh, and uh, Macron, Draghi left. Anyway, uh, they did not find the way to say this. Just one, one last uh, piece of this. Der Spiegel ran actually an extremely interesting a account of the 2008 uh, NATO decision 
to invite uh, Ukraine and Georgia to become members. And it got it right. I, I know a lot of the inside story and it, it, got, it got it right. It's a very interesting read. Uh, and uh, it's even entitled something like When the War Really Began, because mm -hmm. it recognized that it was the invitation to Ukraine and to Georgia to uh, join NATO, or better said, that they would become NATO members, that uh, was the, uh, the, the basis of uh, this war, which now I think everybody uh, except mm -hmm. the, the bubble uh, acknowledges. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, the article's really weird because it uh, describes how Merkel tried to stop it. Uh, it, uh, it describes how the French tried to stop it, uh, stop this uh, invitation. And, and in the end, there was this mishmash compromise that, yes, uh, Ukraine and Georgia will someday be members, but uh, we won't have a, 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 a plan right now of exactly how to do it. So the worst of all words. But then Der Spiegel concludes by saying, you see, Merkel was engaged in appeasement. Yeah. Crazy. The whole story is uh, how they tried to head off a disaster, how they tried to head off a war, and mm. then it's called appeasement. Now, I don't know whether that is something that Der Spiegel has to say to fit into the prevailing opinion or whether it's a, another demonstration of the twisted mindset that we have in, uh, in Europe right now over this. But in any event, it's a real account that shows that Europe, European leaders have known how dangerous and reckless the U.S. unipolar mindset has been, how reckless the expansion of NATO to Ukraine and Georgia as an idea has been. But they don't stand up. And that's the sad point. Brussels is owned and operated by the United States. It's not an accident that the capital of the European Union and the and the uh, headquarter or the the headquarters of the EU and the headquarters of NATO are in the same city. Not an accident. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea for Europe, but not an accident. But the major powers of Europe absolutely could have stopped this uh, had they held mm -hmm. together and gone to Washington rather than to Moscow to put down the line with Moscow. Frankly, uh, we need the call from Biden to Putin. Uh, it's so many years overdue, and that is absolutely what will end this war and save Ukraine, let's add. This is not about giving up Ukraine. This is about saving Ukraine. Hmm. Please, ask, please ask Mr. Sachs if he thinks Germany is violate, violating the 2 plus 4 agreement, and what should be the consequences if yes. But final question. The two plus four agreement, and what would be the consequences if yes? Let's just say that uh, there's, by the way, a lot of water under the bridge at this point, uh, under the destroyed bridges, uh, let's say, uh, because there have been many agreements uh, on uh, both in Europe, by the way, we can add in Iran, JCPOA. Uh, we can add in all the unilateral U.S. departures uh, from ABM uh, from uh, the, from uh, uh, the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Force Agreement. Uh, we can add in the breaking of uh, Minsk I and then Minsk II, which was backed by the entire uh, UN Security Council. Uh, it, it's a miserable, miserable record, in my opinion, uh, Everybody's broken their word, but the underlying direction, the reason, the most fundamental reason for all of this is the complete failure of U.S. diplomacy and the complete collapse of U.S. diplomacy. What we are living through, again, we are at the end of 30 years of U.S. global hegemonic aspirations. This is the basic understanding of all the diplomacy. These fools in Washington got it into their head in 1992. We won. They lost. We run the world. Mm. This is very important to understand. It means we don't have to abide by any agreements. 
We don't have to abide by the most basic agreement we gave to Gorbachev and to Yeltsin. And I was there, by the way, I was an economic advisor to Gorbachev's team and to Yeltsin face to face. And we said to them, NATO will not move one inch eastward. Well, by the time 1992 came, in other words, uh, the ink wasn't dry. The promises were still there, still being made, by the way, when mm -hmm. the Russians toured the NATO headquarters and so forth. They were cheating already. The United States undermined the whole spirit of the end of the Cold War by instead of saying we both won by having peace, the United States said, we won, you lost, and now we do what we want. But it's important to understand, even then, if I could just go back one bit, that played into a deeper meme that goes back even farther, which is, it's not just the end of the Soviet Union we want, it's the end of Russia we want. Break up Russia. And this is a deep meme also, of American foreign policy and should be understood that 1992 was the moment of victory of this hegemonic aspiration. But now the plan was we continue, we run the world. We, we need at most, to, I mean, at least to weaken Russia, but maybe, you know, it, it, it will come apart at the seams. Uh, it will divide internally. Uh, we will uh, will support uh, uh, rebellions in the Caucasus. We'll do other things that will mm -hmm. surround Russia and so forth. So this goes back even further. And I want to take it back to uh, the 1840s, uh, just to conclude, uh, in, in honor of uh, Alexander and, uh, and uh, taking it back to uh, the real roots of hegemony, which is uh, Great Britain because never was there a hegemon with uh, such, uh, such ambition uh, and uh, such a curious view of the world. Uh, but Britain wanted to run the world in the 19th century and uh, it, it taught America everything uh, that it, it knows. And I, I read recently a, a book that I had not read before, a fascinating uh, book by a historian named Gleason, uh, Harvard University Press, I think uh, 1970. And it's an incredibly interesting book called uh, something like The Origin of Russophobia. And the yeah. question is, where did England's hate of Russia come from? Because it's actually a little surprising. Britain has hated Russia, hated Russia mm -hmm. since the 1840s. And mm -hmm. it launched uh, the Crimean War. That was a war of choice in modern parlance, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a war of choice of Palmerston in the 1850s because it hated Russia. Mm -hmm. So this uh, author tries to understand where did this hate come from? Because it was the same kind of vituperative hate that we have now. And mm -hmm. by the way, we hated the Soviet Union because it was communist. But we hated Russia afterwards when it wasn't communist. It doesn't matter. So it's it's a deeper phenomenon. And uh, he tries to trace where this hatred came from. And the fascinating point is Russia and Britain were on the same side in the Napoleonic Wars. From 1812 to 1815, uh, from uh, the, the Battle of Moscow uh, and Russia to, uh, to Napoleon's defeat in Waterloo, uh, they were on the same side. And in fact, for many years, the relations were great, but they were kind of normal. And so this historian reads every snippet of the newspapers, uh, of what's written, of the speeches, to try to understand where the hatred arose. And the key point, and I'll end here, there was no reason for it. There was nothing that Russia did. Russia didn't behave in some perfidious way. It wasn't Russian evil. It wasn't that the czar was somehow off uh, the rails. There wasn't anything except a self-fulfilling lather built up over time because Russia was a big power and therefore an affront to British hegemony. This is the same reason why the U.S. hates China not for anything 
China actually does, but because it's big. It's the same reason until today that the United States and Britain hate Russia, because it's big. So the author comes to the conclusion that the hate really arose as of around 1840, because it wasn't instantaneous, and there was no single triggering event. The British got it into their crazy heads that Russia was going to invade India through Central Asia and Afghanistan. One of the most bizarre, phony, wrongheaded ideas imaginable, but they took it quite literally. And they told themselves this, we're the imperialist. How dare Russia presume to invade India when it had no intention of doing so? So my point is it's possible to have hate to the point of war and now to the point of nuclear annihilation for no fundamental reason. Talk to each other.